Well, good afternoon for our audiences in Istanbul and good morning to Arizona. My name is Aslı Tunç. I'm a professor of media studies and communication and also the vice director at Istanbul Bilgi University. This event is a part of an extensive academic collaboration between Bilgi and Arizona State University. Well, it's such an honor to be introducing Professor Pardis Mahdavi today. Uh, we were expecting to host her physically at our campus around this time, but unfortunately traveling restrictions delayed her visit. But hopefully we will have a chance to welcome her at our Central Istanbul campus in the upcoming spring. Well, fingers crossed. <laughs> It will be difficult to give a brief summary of Pardis Mahdavi's brilliant academic and administrative career, but I will do my best. Uh, Pardis Mahdavi is the Dean of Social Sciences in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and a professor in Arizona State University's School of Social Transformation. Mahdavi's approach to higher education has been informed by her personal journey as an Iranian American woman growing up in the US, as well as her training as an anthropologist where she learned to be reflexive about complex power dynamics. Mahdavi served as a director of the School of Social Transformation before appointment as dean in 2019. Prior to ASU, she was with the Joseph Corbett School of International Studies at University of Denver, where she served as acting dean. Before coming to Denver, she was at Pomona College from uh, be uh, between 2006 and 2017, where she served as professor and chair of anthropology uh, and director of the Pacific Basin Institute of Pomona College, as well as Dean of Women. She has been a follow, fellow at the Social Sciences Research Council, the American Council on Learned Societies, Google Ideas, and the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. She has consulted for a wide array of organizations, including the US government, uh, Google, Inc., and the United Nations. In 2012, she won the WIC Award for teaching at Pomona College. Her research interests include academic freedom, diversity and inclusion in higher education, gendered labor, human trafficking, migration, sexuality, human rights, youth culture, transnational feminism and public health in the context of changing global and political structures. She has published five single authored book, books and one edited volume in addition to numerous journal and news articles. Her first book, Passionate Uprisings, Iran's Sexual Revolution, was published with Stanford University Press in 2008. And her second book, Gridlock, Labor, Migration, and Human Trafficking in Dubai, also Stanford University, um, was published in 2011. Ahdavi's third book entitled From Trafficking to Terror, Constructing a Global Social Problem was published by Ruth Lutch in 2013. And her fourth book, Crossing the Gulf, Love and Family in Migrant Lives, also Stanford University Press, was published in 2016. Her most recent and most personal book, I believe, is titled hyphen about her about the powerful ways that language and identity intertwine. Mahdawi, where she herself a hyphenated Iranian American, views in her own experiences struggling to find a sense of self amidst feelings of betwixt and between. In this book, through compelling stories, Mahdawi tells us how to navigate, articulate, and empower new identities. The title of her highly anticipated talk today is Roots and Branches of Me Too, Social Movement in Global Context. And now, without further ado, Pardis, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Asla, for what a kind introduction. I'm truly humbled um, by this introduction. You've made me blush, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me. I am truly, truly uh, uh, excited about this collaboration between Arizona State University and Bilgi. Um, and I am just heartbroken that I can't be with you in person today, but I will be there, you know, hopefully in April or May. And I look so forward to meeting as many of you as possible. I, I, I very much wish I, I, I were there and I can't wait to can't wait to be there. Um, so, you know, my talk today actually comes from the work that I've been doing on social movements, in particular transnational feminist movements, 
um, looking at the roots, you know, what what transnational feminist movements, you know, laid the groundwork and created roots for the Me Too movement that we saw in 2017. And then what the branches of that have been, again, transnationally focusing on the global south. Um, this is all part of my upcoming book, which will be out next year, called This Goes Out to the Underground. And really um, what I'm kind of asserting in that book is that it, you know, the biggest threats and the biggest um, possibilities we have to destabilize totalitarianism are underground social movements undergirded by feminism um, and civil rights type activities. So that's that's kind of the, the, the crux of, of the book and that's gonna be the crux of, of what I'm talking about today. Although I'm really gonna focus a little bit more on, on me too and sharing some of the ethnographic research that I have done. Um, so I'm just going to pull up the uh, slideshow, so bear with me. Um, all right. Yeah. Great. Hopefully everyone can see that, no problem. And Asli, you'll just let me know if we have a, an issue. Okay, so I'm really looking at these social movements in global context, right? So we have Me Too in 2017. And the argument that I'm making is that there are powerful connections between Me Too, the Arab Spring, Roads Must Fall, Enough, and My Stealthy Freedom. So if those of you who aren't familiar, of course, the Arab Spring, probably everybody's quite familiar with it. Um, actually, the, the precursor to the Arab Spring was the Green Movement in 2009 in Iran, um, which, you know, had, uh, you know, the, the hashtag was undergirded by My Stealthy Freedom, which was a movement made by feminists in Iran who would take pictures of themselves, et cetera, without hijab. So a lot of that undergirded the 2009 Green Movement in Iran, which also undergirded the Arab Spring. Um, also, I'm going to talk a little bit about Tunisia and one of the pivotal moments that brought about the Arab Spring and kind of the gender dynamics and the role of feminists there. Um, following My Stealthy Freedom and, and the Arab Spring, you had Roads Must Fall, which was, of course, in South Africa. Um, and it was kind of a, a pushback to, you know, colonized uh, uh, epistemologies um, in the university. And so um, people were organizing, again, undergirded by feminist and civil rights type organizing. Um, and I should say that, as Asla mentioned, my career has really been about understanding how social movements come about. My first book on Iran's, you know, Passionate Uprisings, was about Iran's sexual revolution and looking at how feminist and sexual politics would lead to a civil rights type movement. So my book kind of ends in 2007, 2008, and I make the prediction at the end that the sexual revolution is gonna birth a civil rights type movement, which is exactly what we saw in 2009. So I'm sort of taking that research and bringing it to a much larger global scale, right? Um, hashtag enough, for those of you who don't know, is a, is a movement in the United States that also came right around Roads Must Fall um, just before Me Too. And it was really brought about by um, young people who were uh, protesting gun violence in the United States. And again, undergirded by feminist and civil rights type um, movements. So I have sort of three interlocking points here for, for the talk I wanna share with you today. One is that there is a resurgence or reboot of feminism going on around the world that is undergirding transformative movements such as Me Too, Time's Up, Enough, or Roads Must Fall. The feminism reboot comes with both challenges and opportunities. Um, in order to overcome the challenges and seize the opportunities, there must be transnational dialogue. So these social movements, they get their power through um, allyship, but also through transnational movements. So one of the things that was so powerful with the Arab Spring is that you had you know, Iran in 2009, and then you had sort of activists sharing their strategies with you know, other transnational social activists in the rest of the region. And so that becomes, this is why this, you know, these social movements, this underground that I write about is the biggest threat to totalitarianism. Feminists, however, fight a triple bind, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, which is different in the global North versus the global South in that, that you know, feminist movements have different types of challenges, but there are a lot of echoes and similarities. Feminists in the global South have come together to find solutions through solidarity. And a very good example of that is actually based in Turkey and it's the Coalition for Sexual and Bodily Rights in Muslim Societies. And that's been a, a really profound kind of example of transnational feminist organizing around sexuality led by you know, Turkey, of course, but connected to the rest of the region. 
So lessons can be learned in how feminism undergirded social movements such as the Arab Spring, Iran's Green Movement, and India's repeal of Section 377 within repressive regimes. So those were the three key studies I focused on. And for those of you who aren't familiar, the repeal of Section 377 uh, was the moment where um, homosexuality was decriminalized in India. So it was a very big uh, moment and movement. So, you know, Me Too kind of exploded onto the stage in 2017, right? You had, you had this sort of, you know, uh, 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 movement that was seen as originating in the United States with, you know, Alyssa Milano, but actually, you know, uh, Tarana Burke is at the, the sort of founder of that 10 years ago, but it was sort of seen to have brought a lot of momentum and fruition. And so a lot of people called the United States the epicenter of the Me Too movement. And while it's true that the reverberations went out from the United States, what I'm arguing is actually a lot of transnational, international organizing laid the roots for what we saw in Me Too. So Me Too could only take root and flourish into a tree, if you will, because of all of the successes that feminist movements had been having around the world. Right. And so while we tend to focus on an image like this, which is, oh, look, everyone's protesting, everyone's, you know, joining the Me Too movement now after it was tweeted in the United States, I think that is a, that is important. But it's also important to think about what got us, you know, to 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 here really to, to the moment in the in the US. So the premise is really asking us to rethink transnational feminism and to point out that these movements actually begin in the global south and if you look at kind of the changes in which these social movements have brought and this iteration of it so we could go back hundreds of years and talk about all of the powerful um uh, you know social movements that have brought about change if we're really specifically talking about this iteration right this sort of mass scale social media um, you know, we can really start looking at, you know, things like the Green Movement 2009. I mean, we're really looking in the last 20, 21 years. And even if you look in the last 20, 21 years, still the Global South is the heart of where these social movements start. And I think that's what oftentimes, um, if we focus on American exceptionalism, that's what we miss, is the fact that all of these have been, have been started. Like you think about um, hashtag bring back your girls, uh, bring back our girls in Nigeria, where feminist organizers helped bring, you know, um, helped fight Boko Haram, right? There are countless examples that I'm going to share with you, but it's important to, to actually decenter that kind of American exceptionalism and recognize that the successes, the initial successes of this round of social movements have actually begun in the global south and really in the middle east and africa so really we we tend to focus a lot on me too as this sort of pinnacle of feminist organizing and it is in many ways but again we have to look at what got us here so a little bit about my research methods. My fieldwork has really been conducted over the course of 19 years, between 2000 and 2019. Um, you know, my inclusion criteria for this project were young people between the ages of 18 and 30 who currently live in urban Tehran or Tunis. Um, and I actually did a lot of fieldwork in Delhi as well. Um, and my specific focus has been on urban young adults in Iran, Tunisia, and India um, who are activists in these feminist movements and that kind of come across lines. Um, I've done a lot of subsequent online field work. Those of us, all of us who are anthropologists can relate because of COVID, here we are, we can't travel. So we've had to rely on online field work and we can definitely have a robust discussion about that afterwards. Um, but I've also done a lot of discourse and media analysis to kind of figure out how um, this, you know, this discursively has entered, you know, the, the global parlance, if, if you will. So what does the field look like for me or what has it been like? And this is why you know, the book is called This Goes Out to the Underground because it began, this fieldwork began in the underground. And this is an underground dance class that I used to um, attend and, and, and observe and met a lot of feminist activists uh, in, in Tehran. So you know, I did participant observations over the last 20 years in parks, cafes, dance classes, beauty salons, underground parties and raves, the streets, runaway shelters, drop-in centers and really looking at how these spaces are have been subverted for the underground and and how you know a dance class ends up in the underground and it becomes a cover for organizing how a beauty salon becomes a cover for organizing um and i you know it's been it's been extensively written about how you know uh sports spaces and facilities have become uh, also um underground spaces for organizing 
my theoretical framework is really informed by, you know, Asafayat Islamism and the politics of fun, uh, Michael Cook, Forbidding Wrong in Islam, Dick Hebdige and the Birmingham School, who, you know, were writing about the about Europe, you know, in, in the 1960s, calling it, you know, subculture and the meaning of style, looking at how um, civil rights type organizing and feminist organizing brought about major changes in Europe in the 60s um, and how people comported their resistance, how they used their bodies to speak back to totalitarian regimes, how they banded together um, and attacked the fabric of morality that the that totalitarianism kind of rests upon. Um, Jeffrey Escoffier's work on sexual revolutions and Anthony Giddens and Jennifer Hirsch's work also on sexual politics has really been uh, informative in, in the work that I've done. So these are the actual theoretical framings that I kind of use in the project, for, uh, the frame of sexual revolution and kind of one of the things we've observed in the past, I mean, if you look at the United States in the 1920s, if you look at Europe in the 1950s and 60s, is that sexual politics lead to civil rights type movements. Now, that you can even take a step back and show that that even began in the global south. And then with this new reiteration, actually, it's the global south that's leading this, this same kind of sexual revolution into the transformation. So sexual politics and sexual cultures as kind of um, a foundational uh, scaffolding, if you will, to talk a little bit about um, the role of, of sexuality in, in social movements. Intimacy and modernity, you know, Anthony Giddens uh, talks a lot about when um, people are living under totalitarian regimes that, you know, when they can't, in the absence of the ability to negotiate citizenship vis-a-vis -vis the state, people increasingly turn to the realm of the intimate to negotiate themselves and their citizenship. And, and sort of that's kind of the seed, that's the original seed where, that sexual revolutions come from is when people turn to, to the realm of intimacy to negotiate modernity, that's actually how you then move on to sexual politics. So Ken Plummer talks about intimate citizenship and people finding new ways of being engaged citizens through their sort of, uh, you know, the realm of the intimate. And then James Farr talks about opening up. James Farr really focused on China and his, you know, work on Shanghai disco and how that work and intimacy and modernity starts to create, people elbow their way in and creates an opening up. Right. And so the Shanghai disco being kind of an example of, you know, an opening that gets widened uh, in, in under a totalitarian regime. Um, and, and then, of course, my methodology has been guided by feminist scholarship, which means that reflexivity and positionality are really kind of at the core of, of what I do. So I want to just kind of introduce some of my interlocutors to you, um, you know, from the field. Um, Rhea was uh, is an activist um, from Tehran, very engaged in the sexual revolution. She then kind of was became a big part of the um, My Stealthy Freedom movement, which was a social media movement, where, as I mentioned, women were taking photographs of themselves without hijab. Now, the hijab is, of course, overdetermined, right? We all know that in, in this Zoom room, I, I would say. Um, it's this, in this case, you know, people are saying, look, this is the language that the regime um, polices, and this is the language that they speak. So we use that same language to resist. Right, and so this is how um, the body, and again, taking feminist um, work and saying, look, this is how the body can actually fight oppression. And so Rhea is a really good example of that. She then went on to work with um, organizers in Tunisia um, through the UAE. So she was actually one of the leaders um, of a feminist magazine that then transferred to the UAE. And so then she started sharing a lot of her strategies with her you know, counterparts across the region. This is right around 2009. Um, one of the things she's most famously known for, of course, and some of you are familiar with, is the 2004 movement Summer of the Cockroaches. I'm not sure if folks are familiar, but of course that was the summer and I was there doing field work where um, women organized to uh, all come out uh, in public with open-toed shoes and, and nail polish. And so prior to that moment, uh, women in, in Iran could not wear open-toed shoes or nail polish. If they were found doing so, their hands would be dipped in cockroaches and cockroaches would be set loose on their feet. 
um, Rhea and her feminist colleagues reasoned that there aren't enough cockroaches in all of Iran if we all come out uh, with open toed shoes. And so that's what happened. And so after 2004, you could wear open toed shoes and nail polish. Now that may seem trite, that may seem insignificant, but it's not. And this is where I want to say, you know, this kind of underground organizing, where we might kind of say, you know, we might smile or laugh, it's significant because it is a threat to the regime's power and it is sending a strong message. And so that kind of organizing deserves as much um, attention and scholarly inquiry as other kinds of organizing, right? So sexual politics in Iran is something I've been working on for decades, you know, um, 2000 to 2006, you had the sexual revolution, which is what I documented in my book. It then led to the green movement. Um, and then, you know, the Arab and Iranian spring. And then, of course, My Stealthy Freedom comes back in 2014 as the kind of precursor to Me Too. That's, you know, a lot of, you see a lot of the echoes uh, in, in Me Too. Um, in Tunisia, uh, an organizer that I followed very, very closely is, is a woman by the name of Iman, who actually used art um, as a form of protest. And she used feminist art. And so she, they worked in the underground and they used to actually deploy feminist art and codes um, to speak to each other. So a different way of using public sphere, right? So all of this is like really interesting ways of using the public sphere. Um, so they they basically would, you know, use graffiti, they would take to, you know, writing symbols and write and, and writing codes to each other and to create a feminist movement that then was a really important part of the Arab Spring. One of the things that people often talk about is what set off the Arab Spring in Tunisia, which was of course the self-immolation of Bouazizi, but one of the things that people don't talk about is why did he set himself on fire? Well, people say it's because of the economic situation, et cetera. Yes, but it was also because he was being chastised by a group of feminists and a female policewoman. And that gender dynamic is what kind of let him, led him to set himself on fire. And that's one really important piece of all this that isn't, that isn't necessarily discussed. So these are just some quotes that you know I, I, I think have have really been resonant for me in the work that I've been doing. Um, this is a quote from Giddens where he says, "Over the past several decades, so it is said, a sexual revolution has occurred, and revolutionary hopes have been pinned to sexuality by many thinkers, for whom it represents a potential realm of freedom, unsullied by the limits of present day civilization." Um, and then I have two quotes from two interlocutors. Um, the first is from a young man in, in Tehran who says, in Iran, in Iran, all things related to sex had doors, closed ones. Now we in this generation are opening them one by one. Pregnancy outside of marriage, open it. Teenage sexual feelings, open that door. Hymenoplasty, open it. Now the young people are trying to figure out what to do with all these opening doors. But I do, so I do think that's a really the, the metaphor of opening, opening up kind of back to the James Farrar um, um, theory is, is, is an interesting one. This, the next one is from a, a woman in Tunisia who says, in Tunisia, sex is in fashion, luxury is in style. How do we live our lives here? We go out to a party, go for drinks at someone's house, then order some food, drink a little, dance a little, go have sex, then get up and repeat your routine the next day. So again, we may see this as possibly flippant, but it's important because this is what's creating the space, that sort of intimate politics, if you will. Now in India, the it's it's been really interesting because it's there's some echoes, but there's also there's also some some differences. And one of the organizers I've been following in India um, is a feminist lawyer who was a big part of the repeal of Section 377. And her her name her pseudonym here I call her Rainu. Um, and so she's a feminist organizer who was working to um, legalize uh, same sex adoption, same sex marriage, um, and she did this a lot of this through um, transnational. Uh, ties with other feminist networks, pre predominantly um, feminists who were working in this in the sphere of sex workers rights. And so one of the interesting things we see here is when different feminist coalitions come together, how, just how strong they can be, like just how much that solidarity, um, how much power that solidarity has. So if you think about the roots of Me Too, right, it goes, I mean, again and again we're just talking about this iteration so post 2000 um you have the blank noise project in 2003 you have pink Trotty in 2009 2011 was the slut walk protest and these are all things that these same activists have been a part of right in 2011 you have why loiter which it's coming at, or after the fatal gang rape of the 23 year old student Jyoti singh um 
This is then followed by the movement in 2015 called Break the Cage. Um, and then in 2017, just before Me Too caught fire, they had a movement called Freedom Without Fear in India, which also had a lot of the similar echoes, um, which then laid the groundwork um, for the repeal of Section 377. So what I've been talking about here are the roots, right? These are the things that have kind of led us. So then you had 2017 and Me Too happens, right? Me Too happens. And then you've got this kind of outpouring of support really around the world for, for the Me Too movement. And so I call these kind of the branches, right? So these are the branches of Me Too. So Me Too inspires, right? It sets off more, more movements. And that is what's most more commonly, you know, talked about, written about, but the, but the roots are very, uh, rarely talked about. And so the important thing is to look at the connection between the roots and the branches, right? And so having these transnational roots allows for the transnational branches to flourish in the sense that people can take Me Too and say, okay, how does it apply to this particular context? So this is Me Too in Japan. I actually ended up living in Japan for a year. Um, Me Too Kenya. Uh, and again, here they're really focused on, you know, whereas Me Too uh, uh, Japan was focused on, 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 like uh, equal pay, et cetera. Me Too Kenya is really about sexual violence. And there, so there are nuances, nuances in these different Me Too movements that they have different like foci, but those come again from the, from the branches. Um, Me Too in Brazil is also about sexual safety and it's about um, destigmatizing sexuality. Me Too in Italy is much more similar um, to Me Too in Japan. Interestingly, I, I'm not I'm not free while any woman is unfree, but it's it's really about kind of that this notion of equality and and kind of um, structures of of violence uh, you know that women are faced with. Me Too in Chile is really about reproductive rights. It, this is Mujeres en la Marcha. As you know, shortly after you know 2017, these uh, feminist activists were incredibly successful in getting abortion legalized in Chile. Um, and, and you saw a parallel movement to that in Ireland at the same time. So these are the very effective branches of Me Too. But again, it's interesting to think about how you have sexual politics as the roots and then sexual and reproductive rights and health as the branches. So that's kind of what I've been uh, looking at a lot. Um, in South Korea, it's, it's also about accountability. So the South Korea Me Too branches are very similar to India where they're actually calling for a repeal of laws and, and it's much more about sort of changing, changing laws. That's the sort of the branch there. So, you know, to this sort of to conclude, we are seeing a new feminism. Okay, and then the question becomes why now? And, and the easy answer for many people has been, well, because of Me Too. My argument is, yes, Me Too is this kind of tree, but there's been these roots and we have to look at the roots to understand the branches. And so I think that it's important for us to think about the roots that have led us, that there's been these really powerful feminist organizing that have actually succeeded in the global South. And that's what has actually brought us to this moment that yes, Me Too can be a catalyst, but it can be a catalyst because of what's happening. And so this new feminism has a lot of commonalities, right? That it's rooted in a critique of neoliberalism. It has the deployment, strategic deployment of social media. It uses the underground codes to speak to each other, codes of dress, codes of art. Um, uh, codes of organizing. And so the success begets success. Successive movements and moments build on one another, which allow us then to branch out and, and to make a much more robust movement. For this tree though to survive, the branches have to not get entangled and break, but we have to see a kind of parallel solidarity where information is being shared because that is what brought about the most success in the roots of the tree to begin with. So I'm gonna stop there and stop the share uh, and take questions. Well, thank you. It was very interesting. I have, of course, tons of questions in my mind, but let's ask you know, the audience. Uh, the participants can either type their questions in the chat box or uh, they can you know, ask directly. by raising their hands. Any questions? So we can't see you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had a question though, just, you know, uh, 
for starting the, the, you know, the other questions. What about Turkey though? I mean, have you looked at, you know, Turkish context? Uh, because the most robust, you know, movement is, is the feminist movement in Turkey for, mm -hmm. for many actually uh, people. I mean, uh, especially Kurdish women, women's movements. So um, what do you think about, you know, women movement, women's movement, uh, movement in Turkey? Uh, have you studied Turkey in that sense? So that's what I was hoping to do. <laughs> that's what I was hoping to do <laughs> on this trip and actually meet with feminist organizers who, you know, as I've shared with you, Asla, you know, there are groups of feminist uh, organizers, both Kurdish uh, and groups of feminist organizers who are deploying the realm of of, I guess it's sort of sport um, in the sense that there are women who play jirit, which is a mm -hmm. Turkish sport. Um, uh, I guess the best translation is javelin throwing, although you might have a better translation to jirit than I. Um, is there a yeah. better translation? No, yeah. jirit. Jirit is, is the right yeah. word, yeah. So you know what it is. So there's a group of women, feminists actually, who have been using the strategies of learning to play jirit um, as a way of kind of coming together and engaging in feminist organizing. What's been interesting too is how they have been sharing their strategies with Kurdish women and with the women that Gail Tumach Lemon writes about. Uh, you know, she's been documenting um, feminist movements in Turkey, um, feminist movements that the Kurdish feminist movements that have actually beat back um, ISIS. Uh, and have beat back totalitarianism. So one of the things that I've been really fascinated by in Turkey is how these groups of feminists have used jirit to both organize, but also to hone their skills, to be ready not just to battle structural violence, but to be ready to battle actual violence. And that is something that I, I've only seen in Turkey and Afghanistan so far, and so, uh, and, and of course, what we see in Afghanistan, it's not Jirit, but it's Bozkeshi, which is um, also a sport on horseback. And it's, uh, I guess the translation would be goat killing or goat catching. It's in Farsi or Dari. Um, but again, these are women who've actually defeated the Taliban in the north um, by honing their skills. So they come together to destabilize the sort of fabric of morality of, you know, the totalitarianism. That, that's kind of what the sexual revolutions do. But now what we're seeing in both Turkey and Afghanistan is taking it to the next level to say, yeah, we're gonna destabilize your fabric of morality. We're gonna attack the ideas, but we're also going to attack in other ways, which has been really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we have a question. Can you see the question? Yes, I can. Yeah, okay. So, so I'll just read it for our audience. I don't know if our audience can see the question. But oh I'll yeah. The question. Yeah. Can you talk about the reaction of societies towards these movements, especially conservative societies? So yes, I can, because I've paid the price personally. Um, so <laughs> in Iran, um, uh, that's the probably the, mo the one I'm most intimately familiar with, but of course in, we see this reverberates in India and um, in, even in Tunisia. Um, feminists pay a high price. Uh, if you go to Evin prison, which is Iran's most notorious prison, um, you will find more feminists and scholars so that actually that has earned the prison the nickname Evin University um, instead of prison. I mean, because of course there has been harsh, harsh, you know, tamp down. Um, you know, oftentimes when elections are coming up, you know, conservative regimes just, they just, they go in, they ransack, you know, uh, feminist magazines, feminist organizing, they go into the underground and they, they do a sweep. Um, I, I personally, after my book on sexual revolution came out, um, I was arrested and kicked out of Iran. So I paid a very high price. Um, so, and, and, and we've seen similar, um, you know, threats to, to uh, feminist organizers, both in Tunisia and in India, where I've done a lot of my field work. People are arrested, people are disappeared. In India, we're, we're hearing a lot of disappearances, which is why I think it's interesting that now you've got these Judith and Buz Keshi feminist organizers who are saying, no, not me. You're not gonna grab me. You're not gonna disappear me. And so I, I'm wondering kind of how these strategies have, have come, come together. Okay. Um, we have another question. Yes. It says uh, from Pinata, I have two somehow related questions. One, what is new in this new feminism? 
And will you say it's globally so for South and North? So I guess here's my the main the main thing that what's what's new in this feminism is um, one the use of social media right so how far and wide people can organize which is related to the second point the transnational nature of this feminism right so you know now we are in a moment where people can share their playbooks they can share their strategies across borders in an instant right because through email through uh, here i am i'm sitting here in arizona and i'm talking with you all in turkey <laughs> right people can share strategies much more quickly than before and people can also come together in solidarity and i think that's something you didn't see probably you definitely didn't see like in the 1960s when you had that birmingham school wave so i'd say that's something that's new another aspect that's new you know people talk about the waves of feminism you know and people say like you know what sets what sets people apart is it career fem so in the united states you had career feminism right the feminists who were saying women should be paid equal have a right to work then you had the next wave which was care feminism which is okay women should have the right to stay home and be you know paid for intimate labor this is a new feminism that i say is not career feminism it's not care feminism i call it justice feminism because it's feminism that's about justice. And what does that justice look like for you? So if, if you are a sex worker, what does justice look like for you? We're no longer gonna debate whether or not sex work is feminist or not. We're gonna ask what justice looks like and we're gonna keep demanding justice. So it's a feminism that comes together around justice. And I would argue that it began in the global South because of course this is where feminists were facing the most injustice in places like Iran, Saudi Arabia, India. You know, that's where people were facing the most significant barriers. And then those playbooks have now come across um, oceans. Um, we have another question from Feride Cekolo. Uh, she says, I would like to ask how the word intimacy translates in different languages in Farsi 4, for example. There's no accurate translation in Turkish. <laughs> yeah. Is there you not? Is there not an exactly. accurate? No. So I think the 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 most uh, close word in Farsi that people talk a lot about with regards to intimacy is is nazdiki, which which is a kind of closeness. It's a kind of closeness that you know it it um it denotes a different level of closeness. So not just let's say you know you're you're, you're friends, but it's a it's a connection. It's a word that's kind of um, at the intersections of 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 proximity, of connection, and of closeness. And and so I think that's the that's the closest translation to to intimacy. I would say. Yeah, uh, we have a question from Diane Sumer. Uh, more specifically, how do you connect the roots in the global south to a critique of neoliberalism rather than rebellion against traditional authority? That's a great question. And so I think I think the way I connect it is. You know, I think it's both. I think it is rebellion against authority, but I think it's a critique of neoliberalism in the sense that it is transnational and in the sense that, um, like what I just mentioned about sex work, right? So I think that there were a lot of feminists who were kind of getting tangled up in conversations about like, well, intimate labor is, you know, what are intimate economies? What is sex work? And, and instead of that, we are now moving beyond that to say, okay, you know, capitalism is you know causing us to kind of get stuck at this level can we rise above it and go into the level of justice and what does justice look like well justice looks like a critique of capitalism because what is what's what what creates injustice is is poverty right what is the what are some of the hearts of injustice marginalization poverty disempowerment that's what creates injustice so justice feminism responds by saying capitalism in and of itself is a violent structure. So that's kind of the, 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 the kind of the connection of the critique. Um, we have another question from Seda Yazgan. She says, can you also talk about the policy changes in different countries? Is there any big change or it's only a narrow change? So I think the biggest change we saw was Tunisia completely new government, right? I mean, you have the Arab Spring, you have feminist organizing and a complete change in government. That was probably the biggest change, whole new government, whole new constitution, okay? Um, in India, you have section 377, which has been on the books since India was founded. Actually, there's a British colonial uh, era. And now we're, you know, 377 is completely repealed. 
right? And so now we're starting to see actually new policies that allow, you know, not just to say, okay, homosexual, you know, decriminalization, but actually allowing for it to flourish. So these are the new policies that are being written. In Iran, one of the things we've seen is new policies around hijab, which again, I know is so overdetermined in this context and this conversation. But the fact that we now have policies that actually allow for different types of outward comp comportment is quite significant, right? We're also getting to a moment where people are pushing back against election policies. Um, you saw that in the most recent election in Iran, that is another evidence of, of policy change. But I do want to say that these smaller changes that you talk about, they are still important. And that's why I talked about the summer of the cockroaches, because I know we might think, well, who cares or whatever. But it's step by step. I mean, people call the Iran sexual revolution the millimeter revolution because it was like the hijab was going a millimeter back at a time. But it was also called the millimeter rev revolution because it was millimeter by millimeter, but and that's the way you gradually chip away at the fabric of totalitarianism in the, you know in, in and through these underground movements, as opposed to kind of big sudden you know changes. Uh, we have another question from Halil Nalcholu. Uh, he says, "Thank you so much for such a great talk, parties." So my question is about the label transnational. What do you think make all the movements cross borders beyond the observer's perspective? Can you talk about observed ties, exchanges? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's actually the heart of sort of what I'm what I'm doing, right? Which is to say, okay, what were the strategies that were used in Iran that were then used again in the Arab Spring? So let's just take that as one example. In Iran, with the green movement that was undergirded by sexual politics, you actually had women coming out at the forefront of marches. You had people saying, not my candidate not my vote and how did they do it they used social media they used cell phones then they used video footage to keep the momentum going everyone is probably quite familiar with the very tragic but very iconic video and image of neda who was killed by the morality police they documented that and then what they did is they took all of that documentation and they sent it to their counterparts in tunisia in egypt in morocco and said this is what we did this is what worked use this, use our videos, use your own strategies. So these are the ways in which the ties, these are the ways in which it was strategies that were actually exchanged uh, uh, in and through these movements, which is what I would say is making them a little bit more transnational in nature because they're borrowing from each other's strategies. And then the, you know, the, it's the, the success inspires, you know, I say success begets success, but the success inspires more people to kind of take a risk, right? It catches, it's sort of catching, right? You know, it's like, well, if they can do it in Tunisia, we should try and do it in Egypt. If they can do it in Egypt, we should try and do it, you know? And, and not, it's not to say that everybody's been successful. And I wanna be very open about the fact that, yes, there have been many zoos that have been unsuccessful, but I think we also need to think about the underground as this space, because we are faced globally with the a rise of totalitarianism globally. And so we have to think about the underground as the space of social organizing that has been trying to shine a light in the darkness. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, in Turkey, I mean, there, you know, lately there, there was a withdrawal from the Istanbul Convention uh, so the problem here in Turkey is mostly homicide, you know, the, the violence against women and killings, honor killings, all those, you know, uh, basically violence. Uh, but still, I think women are very, you know, brave. Uh, I mean, just they, they go out to protest uh, still, you know, at any cost. Uh, what do you think about the Me Too movement in Turkey? I mean, have you, you know, follow the consequences in Turkey? You know, and that's that's something that I'm I'm eager to learn more about because I haven't had the chance to do field work in Turkey, and so I'm always dubious about like just you know making an assessment on what I read. I that's why I've kind of did made sure to embed myself in India, Tunisia, and well, Iran, of course, um, because. You know, there's what you read, there's what you hear, but it's different when you're on the ground. And so, you know, I, I, I hear, I read that, of course, feminists are paying a very high price, a very high price. At the same time, you have things like the Coalition for Sexual and Bodily Rights in Muslim Societies, 
which is based in Turkey, right? And you have this enormously successful coalition that is actually disseminating strategies to places like Canada for how to get sexual and reproductive rights. You know, that's based in Turkey. So yes, there are enormous consequences and pushback, but there are also enormous successes. And I'm inspired by that. I'm, I'm also inspired by the fact that you have groups of women who can defeat enemies that no military in the world can defeat, ISIS, Taliban. What is that about? I mean, that that's profound and, and at great risk. And so how are they using an ancient sport like Jirit in Turkey to train themselves to fight back? These are the things I'm really fascinated by um, because of course the stakes are high and they know the stakes are high. And so they're using this and they're also going back to their roots. I mean, Jirit, Bozkishi, these are old, old, old sports and old forms of organizing. So they're going deep, they're dipping into their roots to now fight the branches of totalitarianism, which I think is incredibly powerful. Yeah. Um, we have two uh, questions. Can you also talk about the effects of COVID on social movements? Do you think the future is bright or because of pandemic, people will be scared of coming out again, being on the streets? Uh, yeah. About level. Yeah. So, you know, I, it's so hard to predict, right? Like, the like we don't have a crystal ball, but I will say one of the things we've seen in the United States is the very powerful organizing around the George Floyd murder, right? And so to this day, you have people, every single day, you have people um, protesting in George Floyd Square, which is in Minneapolis. It's still a, a zone, it's still a, a police-free zone. It's still, a, you know, every day, even despite COVID, even despite the spikes, even despite the weather getting to below freezing, everyday people are out there. So that, you know, I think that says something. And the fact that also at the height of COVID, you know, here in the United States, people were out in the streets after the George Floyd murder. So that tells me that people really, um, they see the interconnections between health justice, racial justice, social justice, and climate justice. If anything COVID has taught us, it's that these are all interconnected. The last 18 months have showed us that we have a triple pandemic, we have a viral pandemic of COVID, we have a social pandemic of racism, we have a climate emergency, and guess what? They're all interconnected. And I think that now that has become clear as day. Like, you know, for, for, for many years, there's been academics and scholars and, you know, small act groups of activists, like screaming that into the wind, but now we're living it. And so I think that more people are inspired by this sense of, wait a second, this, the world is at a turning point. And there are serious justice issues. So my hope, of course, is that justice feminism, this is the perfect time for justice feminism to, to, to come up and come out. Uh, we have another question. Uh, have you noticed a division within the feminist movements uh, between narratives or a debate on what problems are most significant, more significant? For example, in Pakistan with the Arad March, Women March, we see the obvious patriarchy fighting back, but also feminists arguing with their liberal counterparts. So I think that you see that everywhere, right? You always see the division. And that's what I, when I was talking about, you know, even in the United States, you've got first wave feminism, second wave, third wave, you know, you, you always have that. In Iran, you had the Islamic feminists who were maybe, you know, uh, 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 clashing with the secular feminists. But you know, and, and I don't, I, I, I would need to know more about the Pakistan case, but I think about the Iran case and I think about Iran, Tunisia and India. One of the things that India was so powerful in showing is that it used to be before this whole thing around 377, you had the sex workers rights activists who were a group of feminists who were opposed to the um, sort of, uh, you know, all sex work is violence feminists, right? And these were separate groups, but they were able to come together around the repeal of 377. And I think that when they saw what happens when you come together, that maybe has inspired a different type of solidarity. We saw this in Iran as well, in the green movement, you actually had Islamic feminists and secular feminists coming together and saying, look, this new, you know, Ahmadinejad is not good for any of us. So there are ways of reaching across. There's always going to be divides, but I think what we're seeing with justice feminism is that everybody can plug in, everybody can get behind a desire for more justice. And with the rise of totalitarianism, 
it's even more important than ever before. Exactly. Any other questions from the audience? Nope. Oh, okay. Diane. Diane Sunar. More specifically, how do you connect the roots in the global south to a critique? Oh, yeah. Okay. We already did that. Yeah, yes. we already did that. Well, I hope we have more discussions yeah. of this when I come back. <laughs> yeah, and hopefully, yeah. I will be following, uh, of course, Turkey a lot more closely and Afghanistan uh, in the next, in the coming months. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm very uh, eager to understand more about, you know, uh, all the, the sort of feminists on horseback is kind of what I'm <laughs> calling them. Like, what is, how, how, did, how did we get to this moment and what does that moment mean? And kind of how do they plug into justice feminism? I think even just visually, when I look at them, they look like a living embodiment of justice feminism. What is that about? And kind of what are the connections there? So I'm, I'm eager to learn more. Okay. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Uh, well, it was, it was very, very good. Uh, thank you so much for the audience for tuning in uh, at this hour. Uh, so hopefully we can host you here at Istanbul, in Istanbul very soon. Uh, so thank you so much. And thank and you, everybody. Lovely to see every, you. Know, hopefully to see you all meet you all. And, <laughs> and lovely to see you, Asla. And, and, and thank you to everybody who, for joining us this evening. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Goodbye and stay safe. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.